How do you analyze causation in your negligence analysis on a tort essay question? Well, remember we said your negligence analysis was going to be centered on four elements, duty, breach, causation, and damages. And thus far, we've been primarily focusing on the first two elements, which are duty and breach. Whether the defendant owed the plaintiff a duty to conform his conduct to a specific standard of care, and whether the defendant breached that duty of care. Now, when you get past these first two elements, duty and breach, your third element, causation, is going to ask whether the breach of the duty of care owed was the actual and proximate cause of the plaintiff's harm. So your causation analysis, similar to your duty analysis, is going to have two parts. Number one, you're going to have to determine whether the defendant's breach of the duty of care owed was the actual cause of the plaintiff's harm. Sometimes we call this the but-for causation. And secondly, you're going to have to determine whether the defendant's breach of the duty of care owed was the proximate cause of the plaintiff's harm. And if you have both of these things, actual cause and proximate cause, then your element of causation is going to be satisfied. And if you can show damages, then the plaintiff is going to be able to hold the defendant liable for negligence. If all four elements are met, you have duty, breach, causation, and damages, prove all of those by preponderance of the evidence, then the defendant can finally be held liable for negligence. But causation, again, is going to have two parts. Let's start with the first part which is actual cause. How do you show actual cause? Actual cause is going to be one question. You need to ask yourself, would the plaintiff's injury have occurred but for the defendant's breach of the standard of care owed? Okay, so if you can say that this injury would have never occurred but for the defendant's breach, then you're going to satisfy actual cause. So let's look at an easy example here. Keep it really straightforward. Let's say that I'm driving my car down the road. And as I'm driving, I decide to pull out my iPhone, take my eyes off the road, and look down at my phone and start texting one of my buddies. Right? And let's say that it's a really long text. So I'm looking down at my phone for 10 to 15 seconds, really long text. And as I'm doing this, I keep my foot down on the accelerator and I never look up from my phone. And while I'm looking down, I rear end a car in front of me. And the driver of this car, as a result of the collision, suffers a broken leg. Okay, so they want to sue me to recover damages resulting from that broken leg. So they sue me for negligence. Duty and breach, we've discussed ad nauseum, ad nauseum at this point. So let's not worry about doing a duty and breach analysis. Let's, I'll tell everyone, there's a clear duty owed and I've clearly breached that duty by looking down in my phone while driving. So the question is, is my breach of the duty, me looking down at my phone while driving, texting and driving, is that breach the actual cause of the plaintiff's broken leg? That is going to be the question. So what do you ask? Would the plaintiff have a broken leg right now but for me looking down and texting in my phone? If you find that had I never been texting and driving, would this plaintiff have a broken leg right now? And the answer here under the facts that I gave you is probably this plaintiff would not have a broken leg right now if I had never been texting and driving which means we have actual cause. I am the actual cause of the plaintiff's broken leg. My breach, but for my breach, this injury would have never happened, right? That's all you have to do for a but for test. Now, one way that this could be tricky is if I added alternative factors that contribute to the harm. So, or alternative factors that could have contributed to the harm. So let's say, that also while I was driving and I'm texting in my phone, let's say that the sun is out, let's say it's right at sunset 
and I'm driving directly into the sunset. And let's say that this car has a very, in front of me, has a very reflective, you know, paint coat on it. So it's blinding, right? Even though I'm not really even looking up from my phone, it is blinding. The sun is in such a way that it's very hard to see anything in front of me. And let's say too, at the same time, that the roads are wet. Say that it's been raining all day long, the rain has just stopped and the sun has come up and it has also been raining, so the roads are wet. So now we have these other factors involved, right? We got a wet road, bright sun, you know, and I'm texting and driving. That's going to make this but for question a little bit more challenging, right? Because now, if I'm the defendant, I can say, sure, you, you know, but for me texting in my phone, we don't know anything. But for, had I never been texting in my phone, I still could have been sliding on this wet road. I still could have not seen you. Even if I was looking up, I still may have never seen you because the sun was so bright, it was impossible to see anything. So it's not a but for cause that me texting in my phone resulted in your broken leg. There was all kinds of factors that were contributing to this. So I can't show but for cause in that scenario. The plaintiff might have a harder time showing that but for my breach, which was looking down and texting and driving, would this injury have happened? He would have never had this injury, but for me texting in my phone is going to be a little bit more challenging to show when we have all these other factors and conditions, right? So in that case, what the court and a majority of jurisdictions is going to do, because obviously this could lead to some pretty harsh results, most courts have adopted what's usually referred to as a substantial factor test. And this is worded a little bit different in each jurisdiction, but the main idea is if your but for test fails, the court is going to be willing to apply a substantial factor test, which asks, was the defendant's breach of the duty of care owed a substantial factor in bringing about the harm, which is a lower threshold than but for causation. So here you could maybe say that the wet road played a part and the sun glaring played a part, but me texting on my phone was definitely a substantial factor in bringing about the broken leg, right? So it's still going to pass the actual cause test under a substantial factor test, even if we have different contributing factors that could have contributed to the harm, okay? Also under actual cause, another situation that can come up that might make but for causation a little bit tricky is a situation where you have multiple tort feasors or multiple defendants contributing to one indivisible injury. So the famous case here is everybody I'm sure is aware and remembers the hunters hunting in the woods, right? I believe they're quail hunting. One of the hunters sees some quail fly by, so they all take out their shotguns and shoot at this quail. And of course, the plaintiff is injured by some of these shells or bullets, whatever, you know, these shotguns are shooting. Uh, the plaintiff is injured, but the plaintiff can't point to any specific defendant. All that we know is that each defendant, that there was multiple gunshots, right? So. You can't say, but for any one action, right? Because you don't know which defendant actually caused the harm. So the defendants are sitting there saying, hey, look, you don't know any but for causation because we're not even sure which gun, which bullet caused your harm. So you can't show but for causation. And the result in that scenario, if you have multiple tort feasors contributing to one indivisible injury, like one gunshot or something like that, then you're going to be able, the plaintiff is going to be able to hold all of the defendants jointly and severally liable, and the burden is going to shift to the defendants to actually show that they were not the actual cause of the plaintiff's harm. So in that case, the burden would shift, so the plaintiff would sue all the defendants jointly and severally, and it would then shift to the defendants to show how they were not the actual cause. And if a defendant can show that he is not the actual cause of the harm himself, 
then he can be taken out of the lawsuit. But until that happens, the defendants are going to be held jointly and severally liable. So those are the main two issues that can come up with actual cause showing but for causation. The idea that there can be multiple causes contributing to the harm. In that case, it's okay to apply a substantial factor test or if you have multiple tort feasors contributing to one indivisible injury, there you're just going to be able to hold them jointly and severally liable and the burden of proof is going to shift onto the defendants to show that they were actually not the but for cause and if the defendants can do that then they can get out of being liable okay so that's the main ideas with actual cause so i'll illustrate one more example that'll kind of lead into the idea of proximate cause so let's stick with this example right the idea that we have me texting and driving in my phone rear in somebody and now they have a broken leg well let's say let's continue with this hypo that that plaintiff now has a broken leg, so what do we do? We call an ambulance to the scene. Let's say an ambulance comes, picks this plaintiff up, and on the way to the hospital, this ambulance is involved in another accident. The ambulance gets rear-ended by another car, and this second collision causes the plaintiff to break their arm. So now they have a broken leg and a broken arm. Am I liable, the original defendant, me, am I liable for that broken arm? Clearly we said I was the actual cause of the broken leg. Am I the actual cause of the broken arm that resulted from that second collision? And the answer is going to be, well, ask the same question, right? But for me rear-ending this, this plaintiff, but for my breach of the duty of care owed but for me texting and driving would this plaintiff now have a broken arm well if i had never been texting and driving they would have never had a broken leg they would have never been picked up by this ambulance and they would have never been rear-ended while driving in this ambulance so no they would not have a broken arm but for my breach of the duty of care owed so I am the actual cause of that broken leg and the broken arm. And we could continue this hypo, right? We could keep going down this chain of liability. And I'm going to be the but for cause of every event that happens on the chain. So let's say that the ambulance gets to the hospital. This guy's now got a broken arm and a broken leg. So the doctor needs to do surgery. So he's operating on the broken leg and he's negligent. He does something horribly wrong during surgery. Somehow this results in a horrible bone infection. So what do they have to do? They have to amputate the leg. What should have been a simple broken leg, you know, maybe a couple pins or screws in there has now turned into an ambulate, amputated leg. Am I the but for cause? Am I the actual cause of that amputated leg? Yes, right, because but for, had I never been texting and driving, would this person have an amputated leg? The answer is no, they would not have an amputated leg but for my breach of the duty of care owed. If I had never been texting and driving, they would not have an amputated leg right now. So you can see, no matter what happens after the original injury, I am going to be the actual cause. This could be the unluckiest plaintiff in the world. The ambulance gets rear-ended, the doctor's committing malpractice, all of this stuff resulting in more and more and more injuries, and I'm gonna end up being the actual cause of almost all of those injuries that you could ever paint out in that fact pattern. Because, but for my original breach that got this plaintiff you know, that broken leg, which resulted in the ambulance trip, which resulted in needing surgery from the doctor, but for all, but for my breach of the duty of care owed, none of those injuries would have occurred. So I am the actual cause of all of those injuries, all of those harms. So this element, you can see actual cause is pretty interesting and can be pretty devastating for defendants because a lot that would be almost seemingly out of your control under a but for test, you're still gonna be on the hook for a lot of stuff. Now what's interesting though, and where 
this can be somewhat mitigated is under the second part of your causation analysis, which is proximate cause. So if you're thinking about this chain of liability, right? And let's say that this chain of liability starts with the facts of the case. So this is, you know, the first sentence of your tort essay question of your hypothetical is the beginning of this chain, right? And at the end, we have the final injury sustained. So in between all of this stuff, right, we can have all kinds of events and causes and different interactions happening in this chain of liability. So right here, we have the first injury, which would be the broken leg. So in this chain of liability, this chain of causation, we can have a broken leg. And then remember, we have a broken arm when the ambulance is rear-ended. And then the doctor has medical malpractice. So then we have an amputated leg. So let's just say amputated leg. So we have all of these things happening on the chain of causation. And the question is going to be under proximate cause. All you have to do in the second part of your analysis is ask whether there were any events or causes that happened in this chain that were unforeseeable. And if any event or cause was unforeseeable, that's going to break the chain of liability. And everything from that point forward, wherever it is, anything from that event that was unforeseeable, that unforeseeable cause forward, the defendant is now no longer liable. The proximate cause is not going to be there for any event after that unforeseeable event has occurred. We call this a superseding cause in the chain of liability. So if there's any unforeseeable cause that occurs, we call it superseding and it's going to break the chain of liability. And from that point forward, the defendant is in the clear. Okay, but you have to have something unforeseeable happen to break the chain. And what's interesting in the fact pattern that I just drew up here, let me think back through this for a second. So we started with a broken leg from texting and driving rear end. Okay, nothing unforeseeable at this point. And then that person is picked up by an ambulance. Nothing unforeseeable there. Someone sustains a broken leg. Ambulance is going to come. But then that ambulance is rear-ended by another car. Is that unforeseeable? Well, the law typically says that further acts of negligence are foreseeable. More negligent acts do not break the chain of liability. So another car accident caused by negligence is foreseeable. So this broken arm is still, the defendant is still the proximate cause of this broken arm because there was nothing that happened in the chain that was unforeseeable that would break off the liability, okay? So we're still good. So the defendant is the proximate cause of the broken leg. The defendant is the cause, the proximate cause of the broken arm. What about the amputated leg? Well, remember, we just said that acts of negligence are considered foreseeable in the eyes of the law, especially for purposes of proximate cause. So medical malpractice is another form of negligence. So believe it or not, the defendant is also a proximate cause of this amputated leg. So in this analysis, the defendant is the actual and proximate cause of all of these injuries. He's the but for cause of the broken leg, the broken arm, and the amputated leg. And there was nothing in the chain of liability that was unforeseeable that would have broken off his liability. All of this was foreseeable. Any act of negligence is going to be considered foreseeable for proximate cause purposes. So this doctor's medical malpractice that's foreseeable in the eyes of approximate cause analysis. So again, the defendant is going to be the actual and proximate cause for all of these injuries. So what are unforeseeable events that can occur that, are, that would be unforeseeable? Or what are causes that would occur that would actually be unforeseeable? These are sometimes called acts of God things that are caused by nature or criminal or intentional acts. So crim crimes or intentional torts. So if we had something happen here where 
let's say that, I don't know, as the ambulance is driving away, um, a meteorite falls from the sky and hits the ambulance, right? That's gonna be an unforeseeable event. So let's say after the plaintiff broke their leg and the ambulance comes and picks them up, that ambulance gets hit by a meteorite falling from the sky, which causes this broken arm. Of course, at that point, when that happens, the chain of liability from this point forward is going to be broken. So from that moment on, the defendant is no longer the proximate cause of those future harms, right? The chain gets broken when an unforeseeable event happens. That's called a superseding cause. So a meteorite falling from the sky is going to be a clear unforeseeable cause that's superseding from that point forward, the defendant is no longer going to be the proximate cause of those future harms. Okay, so obviously too, if there was any kind of crime or intentional act, you know, say some sort of car thief or car hijacker comes and tries to pick off the ambulance, you know, holds it up in an armed robbery, that's going to be considered unforeseeable. Um, or any type of intentional tour, right, would also be unforeseeable. So that's gonna be the main idea with proximate cause. Just remember that proximate cause is all about this chain of liability. If any unforeseeable events happen, that's gonna be a superseding cause that breaks off the chain of liability. One more note to make on proximate cause, an actual cause, is what is called the thin, the eggshell plaintiff rule, right? Sometimes it's called the thin skull rule, eggshell plaintiff rule. Um, and basically what this says is you take the plaintiff as you find him. So if the plaintiff is already suffering from some sort of medical condition, let's say that the plaintiff has, I don't know, brittle bone disease, right? You hear this one all the time. The disease where your bones are very weak and are very susceptible to being broken and different injuries. Um, if the plaintiff has a condition like this, let's say brittle bone disease, then let's say in this first accident, right, where the broken leg happens, if somebody has brittle bone disease, if I rear in somebody and it shatters everything, right, they have a broken back, both their legs are broken, both their arms are broken, their bones are very brittle, they break easily, am I liable for all of those injuries? The answer is going to be yes. In that case, you take the plaintiff as you find them. This is called the eggshell plaintiff rule. Pretty straightforward. Whatever medical condition they have, if you exasperate that medical condition, you're liable for those damages. You know, even if that would seem unforeseeable under approximate cause analysis, it's not going to be considered unforeseeable. Eggshell plaintiff rule, you can kind of think of as almost an exception to this proximate cause chain because you're going to find the defendant is going to be liable for the plaintiff's harm even if that harm is an exasperation of a pre-existing medical condition. Okay, so that's really, I think, all of the issues that could be covered with actual and proximate cause. Just remember that the plaintiff is going to have to establish both actual and proximate cause to satisfy this causation element. And that's going to be all that you need to do for your causation analysis. So at this point, we've covered duty, breach, and causation. All that's left to discuss is damages. And if, remember, if the plaintiff can establish all four of these elements, by preponderance of the evidence, then he's going to be able to hold the defendant liable for negligence. So in our next video, we'll finish our discussion of negligence up, talking about damages. But until then, guys, I wish you all the absolute best, and I'll see you at our next video.